So the thing about the postmodernists, and I'm going to speak mostly about Jacques Derrida because I'll consider him the central villain. Now, he actually, he, he may, they make a point. Explain he, who he is, please. Well, he's a, he's a French philosopher, French intellectual who became quite popular in the late 1970s and then was introduced to North America through the Yale Department of English. And of course, English literature is one of the disciplines that has become entirely corrupt. And so D Derrida was a Marxist to begin with, but that fell out of favor because it turned out that Marxist political doctrine kept producing evil empires and even radical left French intellectuals were forced to admit that by the mid-1970s. You know, they'd put their head in, their, in the sand for 20 years, 50 years really, uh, thoroughly in the sand and made sure their ears were full too. But by the mid-1970s, the evidence that that was the case was so overwhelming that even a French intellectual couldn't deny it anymore. And so they started to play sleight of hand with the Marxist ideas. So instead of trying to promote the revolution of the working class against the, uh, against the capitalist class, let's say, they started to play identity politics and said, well, we can just separate everybody into oppressed versus oppressor, but we don't have to do it on economic grounds. And so we, and we can call it power instead of economics. So that was part of it. And then the other thing, but the fundamental critique that Derrida focused on, this is, this is, this is really worth laying out because that, the problem that he discovered, the postmodernists discovered, was discovered by a variety of other people at the same time in other disciplines. So, for example, among the pe people who were studying artificial intelligence, since the early 1960s, it was always supposed that we'd be able to make machines that could move around in a natural environment without too much problem. And the reason we could do that was because the world, in some sense, was just made out of simple objects. There they are, and all you have to do is look at them, and you see them, and that's vision. And then the complex problem is not how to see or what to see, but how to act in reference to what you see. But it turned out that the AI people ran into this problem, essentially sometimes known as the frame problem. And the frame problem is, is that there's almost an infinite number of ways to look at a finite set of objects. So the fact that... It, it, that vision, for example, turns out to be way, way, way more complicated than anybody ever ever estimated. And in fact, you can't actually solve the vision problem until you solve the embodiment problem. So uh, an artificial intelligence that doesn't have a body can't really see, because seeing is actually the mapping of the world onto action. And so that was figured out more, more or less by a robotics engineer called Rodney Brooks. But, but what's at the bottom of this is the idea that any set of phenomena can be seen a very large number of ways. So like there's a bunch of pens in front of me here. You know, and when I look at them, my brain basically notes that they're a grippable object with which I can write. So I see the function. Like, like if you look at a beanbag, you see a chair. Not because it's got four legs and a seat and a back, but because you can sit on it. And, and most of what we see in the world, we actually see functionally rather than see as an object and then interpret the object and then figure out what to do. So the function of the object constrains our interpretation. But there's an endless number of interpretations. So, for example, if I was going to paint that, you know, paint on canvas this set of pens and try to do it in a photorealistic way, I would be looking at tiny details of these objects, the, the multiple shades of red that are there and the multiple shades of, of white and black. And, you know, I would decompose it in many, many ways. And so... The AI guys ran into this problem, which was that looking at the world turned out to be exceptionally complex, and that's still being solved now. Okay, in, in literature, the same thing happened. What, what the postmodernists realized was that if you took a complex book, let's say the Bible, for example, or a Shakespeare play, there's an endless number of potential interpretations that you can derive from it because it's so complex and so sophisticated. So imagine that, well, you can interpret the word... You can interpret the phrase, you can interpret the sentence, you can interpret the paragraph, you can interpret the, the, the chapter. Let's say you have to interpret that within the confines of the entire work, then of the entire tradition, and then within the context of discussion that you're currently having. And all of those things affect how you're going to interpret the play. So, there's an, so that their conclusion was, well, there's an infinite number of ways to interpret a text. And then their conclusion was, well, there's an infinite number of ways to interpret the world. And there's a, there's a way in which that's correct. And so the next conclusion was, there's no right way to do it. So you could do it any old way. 
And then their next conclusion was, oh, and this is where the Marxism creeped up again. Oh, people interpret the world in a way that facilitates their acquisition of power. Now, that's where the bloody theory starts to get corrupt. Because, yes, a bit, but also no, right? Because, and this is why they're wrong. This is why they're wrong. You see, the world is complicated beyond our ability to comprehend. So there is a very large number of ways you can interpret it. But, but, you have to extract out from the world a way, a game from your interpretation that you can actually play. So if the lesson that you extract from Hamlet is you should kill your family and yourself, then we might say that that's not a very functional interpretation, right? Because first of all, people are going to object to that, right? It, it ends your life. It ends many people's lives. People are going to object to it. And it isn't a game that you can play over and over again in the world. So when we're, when we're interacting with the world, you see, what we're trying to do is to extract out a set of tools that we can use to function in the world because we're constrained by the world so that we don't suffer too much and so that the things that we need in order to continue can be provided. And we need to extract those out in a way that other people will, so that other people will cooperate and compete with us in a peaceful and maintainable way. So that then you think, well, we have to extract out an interpretation that allows us to live and thrive over multiple periods of time in multiple environments while we're doing the same thing with other individuals who are motivated the same way. So there's a tremendous number of constraints on our interpretations and the postmodernists don't care about that at all. All they do is say, well, no, no, you can interpret the way the world, the world any way you want. All people are ever doing is playing power games based on their identity and there's going to be no crosstalk between the power hierarchies. It's not even allowed. That's why they don't engage in dialogue. See, just to talk to, like, let's say if you're a, if you're a postmodernist, just to have a discussion with someone like you, you know, a heterosexual, what do they call a cisgendered male of power, you know, and, and white to boot, it's like, that's, that's an evil act in and of itself, because all you're doing by engaging in dialogue with that person is validating their, their power game. That's all. You see, and this isn't, this isn't, this is no aberration that these people don't engage in dialogue. That, it's no aberration. It's built right into the philosophical system. They regard the idea, of, the idea that if you're in one power group and I'm in another, the idea that we can step out of that group, engage in a dialogue, have our worlds meet, and produce some sort of... Uh, understanding of each yeah, other. Yeah, yeah, some sort of negotiated understanding. No, that's part of your, your oppressive patriarchal game, that idea. That whole idea is part of your game. So... If I even engage in the dialogue, I'm playing your game, you win. It's a complete assault. It's a complete... You, people don't understand that postmodernism is a complete assault on two things. One, it's, it's an assault on the metaphysical substrate of our culture. And I would say that the metaphysical substrate looks something like a religious substrate. So it's a direct assault on that. And the second thing it's an assault on is everything that's been established since the Enlightenment. Rationality, empiricism, science... Everything, clarity of mind, dialogue, um, the idea of the individual, all of that is, is not only, you see, it's not only that it's up for grabs. That's not the thing. It's to be destroyed. That's the goal.